Hello! I'm Ben. I'm here with Joffrey, and today we're coming from Grandma's Room. Grandma's Room Podcast. And it's episode 69! 68! Not 69. God damn it! 68. And today we are talking about Teddy Roosevelt's misadventures and the story of Alexei Maresiev. I perfected the name earlier, but I forgot. You lost it. Yeah. So. Well, well. Do you want to start? I mean, I guess. Right now? Yeah. Okay. okay. So, Theodore Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt. Fun fact, the teddy bear, named after Roosevelt. He was born on October 27th, 1858. Do you know why it was named after him? No. Really? Yeah, I don't know. He was on a hunting trip, and he didn't shoot. He didn't shoot any bear. But then all these guys he was hunting with cornered one. He's like, oh, I can't do that. It's not fair. Uh, I did hear that. I for, yeah. And then woman made the teddy bear for him. Teddy bear. Teddy bear. Yeah. He was, well, he was born in New York City, and he died in his sleep at age sixty on January sixth, nineteen nineteen. The end. <laughs> no, I didn't want to just do like a biography. Of him, so I just like got like the awesome stories from his life. Mm. So we'll start with when he was a cowboy. So when his mother and wife died on the same day, it was too much for him to handle. So he moved to North Dakota. He became a cattle rancher. Uh, he got he thought so highly of the work and the man he worked with that he said, "I never would have been president if it, if it had not been for my experiences in North Dakota." So he loved cattle ranching. He was up there for a couple years. And early in 1886, the ice on the Little Missouri River was starting to thaw, and three people took his boat, and they pissed him off, like, a lot. So, that was, like, the only boat on the river at the time, so he was like, if we see any boat, it's, it's going to be my boat. Yeah. So, he took his ranch hands, Bill, S- Bill Sawall and Wilmot Dow, and they all armed themselves. Uh, they including the thieves. The thieves were also armed when they were like hunting them down. So they're like, we're gonna go. We're just gonna pack a bunch of camping supplies. And we're gonna go hunt these dudes down because I want my boat back. Mm. So they tracked the thieves on the river when it was dangerously cold. They made their own boat because they didn't have a boat, so they just built a boat to track them down mm. and take their boat. Um, it was dangerously cold, like negative. It's it's up in um, yeah, it's in, like next to Canada. It's in North Dakota. <laughs> so. They even saw the tracks of a mountain lion that was, like, hunting a deer while they were, like, on the bank of the river. So, like, the whole time that they were hunting these people down, it was, like, pretty dangerous to be doing They were so. in peril. Yeah. Which is, like, it seems to be Teddy Roosevelt's forte to just put himself in danger because he loved it. Mm. Um, Do you think he got off the danger? I think so. The people that they were tracking were known as cattle killers and horse thieves around the area, and... There had also been, like, vigilantes that, th- like, tried to catch them earlier in the fall, and they got away from them every time. Like, they never, they were never caught. Here, one second. Bless you. Thank you. So, when they went after them, like I said, they had to build their own boat, and they packed flour, bacon, and coffee to last them at least a couple of weeks, along with, like, bedding and other survival equipment they'd need to survive the cold weather. Roosevelt also took a camera to document their capture. Once they captured them, he wanted a picture with the people. So he said of his ranch hands that traveled with him, he said, there could have been no better man for a trip of this kind than my companions, Sawal and Dow. They were tough, hardy, resolute fellows, quick as cats, strong as bears, and able to track men like, or travel like bull moose. Which that was Teddy Roosevelt's party. Mm -hmm. He like ran for president under the bull moose party. So... After three days on the river, they saw the boat on the bank, and inland a bit, they saw smoke from a campfire, so, like, those are, those are our guys. Like, so, when Teddy looked at his partners, they were, like, out on the river, he, like, looked back, like, are you ready? And he said they looked grim and eager, and, like, they were, like, looking for, like, a fight. And they immediately went to work bringing the boat to shore. Teddy was instantly into bushes. He was, like, he said, for a moment, we felt a thrill of keen excitement, and... And our veins tingled as we crept cautiously towards the fire, for it seemed likely there would be a brush. So the one German, who was, like, one of the thieves, um, he was alone at the camp, and they took him by surprise. One of Teddy's men 
took him away to make sure that he kept quiet, like if he saw the other two coming in, because they were out hunting. So Teddy on the other ranch hand sat at the camp and waited for the other two to come back. So an hour later, when the other two people were coming back from hunting, Teddy and his partner waited until they were 20 yards away so that they were like kind of close. And they emerged from the bushes. They were they had their rifles out there, like yelling at them to keep their hands up. And they had the thieves. Um, and like they had okay, they had the thieves at this point. And Roosevelt kept a watch over them as Sewall and Dow chalked firewood because they were like gonna camp out for a little bit. So they couldn't tie them up uh, because it, I guess they just didn't have the equipment to tie them up. Or so they made them took their boots off so that they couldn't run away because apparently like up in where they were at there's a ton of cactus or cacti okay so like if they were going to run they'd probably get frostbite and destroy their feet on cacti so they didn't Mm. they had no urge to run away plus the dudes had guns yeah they took their guns so teddy said this time he says by this time we were pretty well cowed as they found out very quickly that they were that they would be well treated so long as they remained quiet but would receive some rough handling if they attempted any disturbance. Next morning, we started downstream, having a well-laden flotilla. For the men we had caught had a good deal of plunder in their boots, including some saddles. So by boots, he meant, like, just on them. Uh, Finnegan, who was the ringleader, and the man I was especially after, I kept by my side in our boat, and the other two being put in their own scow, heavily laden and rather leaky, and with only one paddle, we just kept them just in front of us, a few yards distant, the river being so broad that we knew any attempt to escape would be perfectly hopeless. So they came to an ice block on the river and they had to wait eight days with their prisoners for the ice to clear. So they're just pretty much on a camping trip with their prisoners. Mm-hmm. Um, well, also trying to avoid a group of Native Americans that um, had the, poten- the potential to be hostile because everyone's taking their shit. Yeah. So they're like, if we see anybody, we're probably going to get into a fight with them. So him... And he like he split up from Sal, uh, Sawal and Dal, and Teddy took the prisoners by himself and loaded them onto a wagon he borrowed from a settler, and he followed the wagon on foot for hours to Dickinson to turn them over to the sheriff. And I think the trip said it was like 36 hours. <laughs> he was like watching these dudes on the, um, in the wagon. So he got $50 for fees as a deputy sheriff once he got back. They paid him 50 bucks for his... 300 miles covered <laughs> he yeah he brought them 300 miles to the sheriff he was like they took my fucking boat so, so that's like six cents a mile right it's not worth it i mean i guess for your honor yeah he's gonna let shit get taken from you but one of his prisoners mike finnegan later wrote to him from prison saying at the end of his letter p.s should you stop should you stop over at Bismarck this fall? Make a call to the prison. I should be glad to meet you. So I guess he like respected him after yeah. that because like he treated them well and everything. I guess except taking their boots. But yeah, that was his time as a cowboy. And then he also fought at the Battle of San Juan Hill in Cuba in the Spanish American War. So July fifth, nineteen eighteen ninety eight. Ten years after that, um, they were in Cuba. Teddy and his Rough Riders had been taking fire and artillery fire, like rifle and artillery fire, all morning. And they were steadily losing men to the fire and from the heat, like heat exhaustion and everything. So Roosevelt knew that if they didn't attack head-on soon, because this hill is super important, like they needed the hill, because like if the Spanish were up on the hill, there was no way that they were going to survive because they had like the high ground. Mm-hmm. That's what you want. So he knew if they didn't attack them head-on, that they would be wiped out completely. He was like, we're going to lose people attacking them head on, but we have more of a chance of living if we take the hill. So he rode over to his captain and the captain hesitated to give orders. And Roosevelt was, he took, he was like, you know what? I am the senior officer here. So we're going to attack that hill. So he got on his horse, yelled for his men to charge the Spanish lines. As they charged up, he rode up and down the line, supporting his men, like giving them what they needed, helping them like, and then American Gatling guns opened up, which the Americans, like, they were moving into position as they were charging the hill. So it was, like, kind of a race against time. Like, you got to get the guns up, like, now. Mm-hmm. So they opened up, which the Americans initially, like, the soldiers that were charging, they thought they were Spanish. So they were, like, starting to, like, stop. And then Roosevelt was riding up and down the line, up, up and down the line yelling, 
it's our Gatlings, it's our Gatlings, like, keep, keep going, and then, like, it just seemed like a bunch of chaos, as in, I guess, any war. War, movie. yeah. So then, Rough Riders and the 3rd Intense Cavalry, they got all mixed up, but they kept charging the hill, and they eventually overpowered the Spanish. Uh, when the Rough Riders got to the top, they found that the enemy lines had just been, like, freshly abandoned, like, they had just escaped. Mm. So, after that, 600 Spanish soldiers mounted a counterattack, and they, the Americans had already gotten the Gatlings up on top of the hill, or they were already moving them up, so only 40 of the 600 Spanish men got even close to Teddy and his men. So, like, he, if he didn't, like, call that charge, they, put a, they probably all would have been wiped out. Mm. I just nearly fucked up every word I just said at the end there. So that was him in San Juan, and you know he, he's a mountain climber, too? Uh, this is a really quick little aside. When Rosenfeld, when Rosenfeld, Roosevelt got married to his wife, I think it was his second wife because after the first one died, they went on a honeymoon to Europe. And while they were there, he was like, you know what, I'm going to leave for a little bit and I'm going to go climb the Matterhorn. So he climbed the Matter- Matterhorn, which is nearly 15,000 feet. I'm at, like, that's like Shit. three-ish miles high. He's like, <laughs> he's like, I'll see you. Like, I'm going to go climb this real quick. Like, I know it's our uh, honeymoon. So he went and climbed the mountain. And that's pretty much it for the Matterhorn. It was just a quick story. I couldn't find, like, I searched for a story. Like, I could usually find, like, a couple of articles explaining, like, the whole whole thing happening. I could not find mm-hmm. anything for the Matterhorn. Hmm. So there's also an assassination attempt on his life. You've, I'm sure you've heard of that. Yeah. So in 1912... During a presidential campaign, uh, he was giving a speech. He was shot in the chest by a thirty-eight revolver. So when he was shot, he had a speech in his pocket. It was 50 pages long, folded up. So it was pretty thick. Yeah, it's, it's 100 pages. Yeah, it slowed down the bullet so that it didn't like actually kill him. Like It still went in him, Yeah, but it didn't kill him. Um, the assassin, he became obsessed with Roosevelt after having a weird dream about him. Have you heard that? He had a dream where President McKinley sat up in his coffin and pointed at a man in a monk, like a monk robes or whatever. And he was like, um, this is my, my murderer, avenge my death. But then the man that was in the monk suit was Teddy Roosevelt in his mm-hmm. dream. <laughs> it was a strange dream. And Roosevelt, I mean, he obviously didn't kill the president. I just yeah. don't, I don't know, I don't know why that he would act on a dream like that. Yeah. So after he was, after he was shot, Roosevelt stood there. And then he said, friends, I shall ask you to be as quiet as possible. I don't know whether you fully understand that I have just been shot, but it takes more than that to kill a bull moose. But fortunately, I have my manuscript. So you see, I was going to make a long speech, and there was a bullet. There was a bullet and Wait, that there is a bullet. There is where the bullet went through, and it probably saved me from it going into my heart. The bullet is in me now, so, I, so that I can make... So I, that I cannot make a very long speech but I will try my best. Then he went and made an 84 minute long speech. So well over an hour. Yeah. So he did that. He was also very into boxing. Um, since he was a young man, he was a huge fan of boxing and even boxed often like in the white house. He, he had like a boxing ring in the white house. That's pretty cool. So, so yeah, he boxed often in the white house until he got hit in the eye. He said, I had to abandon boxing as well as wrestling, for in one bout, a young captain of artillery cro- cross-countered me on my on the eye, and the blow smashed the little blood vessels. Fortunately, it was my left eye, but the sight had been has been dim ever since, and if it had been the right eye, I should have been entirely unable to shoot. Accordingly, I thought it better to acknowledge that I had become an elderly man and would have to stop boxing. I then took up jiu-jitsu. <laughs> so, <laughs> He, he went blind in his left eye because of boxing, so he's like, I'm just going to do jiu-jitsu instead. So, the South American Expedition. Have you heard of this? Yeah, and uh, the Amazon. Yeah. Yeah, I have a book about it. What's it called? Uh, Is it the River of Doubt? Cause I, I don't know. That was I got it at the, at the book fair. Nice. So it probably wasn't that one because uh, I'm pretty sure that one's a is it a really thick book? I mean, it's like that thick. It was it was good. I, I got it in like middle school, huh. so like it wasn't like a little kid's book. I saw that one like referenced a lot. I don't know if it's the same one. 
but so yeah after he lost his last presidential run he went on a trip to south america on what he called his last chance to be a boy which i don't know how old he was at this point <laughs> well wait that was like 1912 uh, i don't know when he lost his last race. i think was that's the year yeah so 1912 when was he born um well, you said he was 60 when he died, and that was in 19, 1919. He was born in 58, right? 1858. 1858. So he's been in his fifth, Something four. Well, wait, you said he... When did you say he died? Um, I know you said that. Yeah, I did. 1919, right? I think 19, eight, 19, he died in 1960. No, 1919. Okay, 1919. So whatever he was when he, when he died... 60, he was 53. God damn, dude. Okay, he's 53 at this at this point. So him and his partners traveled uh, the River of Doubt from December 12, 1913 to February 25th, 1914. So it was a couple months long, like this trip. Then on February 27th, they started the expedition down the last unexplored river in South America. So one of his companions, Father Zelm, originally wanted to go down a well-explored river, but Roosevelt didn't think this had enough major risks involved, so they started on the River of Doubt, my which book. was uncharted. My book is called Death on the River of Doubt. Okay. Um, The river wasn't on any maps at the time, and they likely had numerous hostile Indian tribes, and the head of the American Museum of Natural History, Henry Osborne, wrote to Re Roosevelt like multiple letters uh, to do the original... Uh, river instead like pleading with him like please don't do this like mm -hmm. so roosevelt replied tell osborne i have already lived and enjoyed as much life as any nine other men i know i have i have had i have had my full share and if it necessary for me to leave my bones in south america i'm quite prepared to do so so he was like fuck it if i die i die i guess yeah. um father's on a pen uh, he ended up not being experienced enough for this like the uncharted trip so they replaced him with the South American Colonel Candido Rondon. He was a uh, military officer with the Brazilian government, and they also took multiple like Brazilian local like locals, people that knew the area, mm -hmm. and everything. So they started on uh, muleback and had to travel 400 miles on the mules before they reached the river. That itself, dude. Yeah. <laughs> when they reached the river of doubt, they realized that they weren't even close to prepared enough, and. Apparently the guy that was packing everything, he was like, well, fuck, it's like a former president. We have to pack like all kinds of sweet foods and stuff. And he was like searching through all, he's like, what the fuck is this? He was yeah. Like, he was like, this you is we're going to die. Like, this is all going to go bad. You should have packed food that would last us. And then it said like, they're like already stretched in for time now because they didn't mm -hmm. have enough uh, food and, or anything for what they were supposed to do. So they decided to split up. One team went on the river about second on the Rio Arapuanya which Rondon believed would connect at the bottom, like the two rivers would connect. And they thought if they split up, it would speed up their travel a little bit, so okay. they would like be able to conserve their supplies. So the, the boats they were on weren't the right boats either. They were like, they were canoes, but they were like, uh, I forget what they called them, but they were only inches above the water. Okay. Like the tops, which the water was infested with caimans. Uh, they said school bus length anacondas and piranhas fuck that dude so they had like no protection from things in the water yeah. pretty much you stick your hand out you can get bitten by something um the land that they would land on to like take a break from the water is also dangerous it had uh disease carrying insects venomous snakes poison frogs and jaguars so they're pretty much fucked but that's what he wanted to happen i guess like he was like fuck it he was like that other river is not cool enough mm-hmm so they started going very slow. The first day they only covered six miles, which this journey is like 900 some miles. Uh, they then late a little bit later in the trip they lost two of their canoes. They were uh, pulling them. They were walking on the bank but pulling the canoes with ropes. So two of them broke loose. They had supplies on them. They lost them. So they had to stop for a couple of days and build a new canoe because they couldn't keep going without their canoes. So Roosevelt's son Kermit and two of the Brazilian locals, this is after they built their canoe and kept going, uh, they they tried to find a route a crowd, like around these, and, like there's really rough rapids. So he, his son Kermit and two of the Brazilian locals, they got in the canoe and they're like, they went around trying to find a thing, like a route around, and then they hit 
like very rough rapids. Um, one of the locals was lost, never found again. But when they raced to the bottom of the rapids, like on land, they found Kermit and one local alive. But they were like, we don't know where the other guy went. So he disappeared. So after this was over, they they were traveling for a little bit longer. They landed. Rondon, the Brazilian colonel, he got up. He, him and his dog went hunting. And they heard this monkey call. And his dog went running towards the monkey call. And when his dog came back, it had two arrows in its side. So the natives were imitating monkey calls to try to lure them in. Mm. And it was later confirmed that there was it was a cannibalistic tribe. They were trying to f- catch them and eat them. So they he saw that, and he was like, fuck it, I'm out of here. Like yeah. he, they, they ran away from that. So they kept slow, slowly making it down the river. But two, two canoes got stuck between rocks. Teddy jumped into the water, slipped, gashed his thigh open, and it got infected. And at the same time it got infected, there was an outbreak of malaria through their camp. So he had this crazy infection yeah. was like and malaria. He wasn't even able to walk. Um, they said he was like in and out of consciousness and he was like in this trance like state because he was so fucked. He had like a fever of like 105. So he how do, wait, how do you think they took temperature back then? Thermometers. Okay. <laughs> they had a doctor with them. They had like a, oh, okay. a doctor. They, a doctor okay. went along with them. So, um, he realized that he was like, I'm pretty much fucked right now. So he told Kermit and another man that was with him, his name was Cherry. Uh, he said, boys, I realize some of us are not going to finish this journey. Cherry, I want you and Kermit to go on. You can get out. I will stop here. And he was like, Kermit obviously was like, I don't care what you say. We're bringing you out. Even if you die, we're still bringing your body out at least. Mm-hmm. So he's like, he was like, I know I'm not going to change Kermit's mind. So he was like, I need to at least try to push on so we don't slow him down even more. So they said after this, when he was like too sick to do anything, he literally laid in the bottom of the canoe as they were going down to try not to like get in anybody's way. Mm -hmm. So while he was sick, one of the locals that they brought along, um, they said this is one of like the gravest crimes you can commit on one of these expeditions. He was stealing rations. So especially since they were already short, like Mm -hmm. handed like food wise, um, he said where another local confronted him, he, the dude that was stealing rations shot him in the chest with a rifle and killed him. And they were in two little different camps, like just sh- like not right next to each other, but like yeah. the other dude could run to their camp. So he came back running, screaming that, that his friend was murdered. And they said it was like, for, it was like Roosevelt was super sick, but somehow he shot up out of bed with a rifle and ran to the other camp to try to like, I guess, justice. Yeah. I don't know if he was going to shoot him or what, but, like, or, like, try to arrest him, but, like, they said, um, they couldn't find him, so he said any fate worse than killing him, he was, like, this justified, I guess, they left him in the jungle, they were just like, fuck it, we'll just leave him, Mm -hmm. (laughs) he's hiding anyway. Uh, Roosevelt could not go another day after this without surgery on his leg, because it was getting bad, like, skin was starting to rot and everything, Mm -hmm. so they had no painkillers, so their doctor just went ahead and started doing surgery. And they said Roosevelt didn't even flinch when he was, like, cutting him open and shit. He just, like, sat there and took it, like, surgery on his leg. Um, Finally, they met some rubber tappers, which, I mean, I think that was just, like, people who were, like, rubber plantations and stuff like that, getting rubber. Yeah. Rubber trees. So when they were first coming up on them, they were, like, yelling at them to stop and everything. And when they identified themselves, they were like, oh, shit, Teddy Roosevelt. So they, like, welcomed them in and, like, took care of them, gave them some supplies and this was after months of setting out. They finally met with their, with the team that went on the Rio Arapuanya. So after this, they traveled 950 miles. They, got, they finally met back up after 950 miles. Rondon was responsible for naming the river now, and he named it uh, Rio Theodoro, which is the Roosevelt River. I don't know if it's still named that. I should look that up. Roosevelt stayed sick for months after this and had lost 60 pounds and he had to like use a cane for a little bit afterwards but when he got back to New York some people were like he was telling people what happened they're like yeah you're fucking lying like that there's no way you did all that stuff so he went on a speaking tour through America and Europe to prove like what he did I guess it's, like it's still named after him nice so yeah that's my uh Theodore Roosevelt stories pretty cool what a man yeah yeah. Yeah. Armpits at you too. Oh. 
You need to get old scratch. Oh man, I'm scratching it hard. I just scratched it and it gave me goosebumps. Oh. Tell me about your pilot. Okay. So this is about a Russian pilot. His name was Alexei Marisiev. So by April 1942, Germany's blitzkrieg on the Soviet Union was in full swing, and the Germans in the north were hell bent on taking Moscow. And like you know, that's a pretty important city in Russia because it's their capital. <laughs> And so the Russians had to defend their important oil fields, which was also in like around Moscow, uh, or else the Germans would be like unstoppable in the east. Uh, supplies like food, clothes, and ammo were regularly being shipped in to the Soviet Union by us. So uh, the Russian army was like barely holding their shit together, and uh, America was was only able to give the Russians so much. But the USSR had like like, they had so many soldiers to throw at the Germans. They, it was crazy. Hmm. But, uh, after only three months, um, uh, Alexei Mirosev, uh, he had already made his presence known as, like, a great Russian pilot. He was, like, super good, uh, hot shot. So, uh, lack of materials allowed the Russians to outmaneuver the German pilots because they used, like, wooden wings and, like, because metal was super scarce in Russia. So they used like wooden wings, and it said that uh, like a plane leaving the factory, the landing gear might be different lengths. So like they had to do like a bunch of their own repairs and their own tweaks whenever they were like about to fly them. Like custom planes. Yeah, and uh, so on April fifth, uh, he was outnumbered and shot down by the Germans and was thrown from his plane like just before he landed. And, uh, so when he regained consciousness, he knew that he had to, uh, get out of enemy, enemy lines, but he had shattered both of his legs in the crash. So, like, obviously, it's not looking too good for this guy, but he had only a few things to eat, and so he had to resort to eating pine cones and tree bark, uh, and, like, like, letting, like, snow, like, melt in your mouth and then drink it, so he wouldn't just be eating snow and, like, lowering his body temperature. Mm -hmm. So even though he was only a few miles from the closest Russian position, uh, Germans were like crawling all around it. So he's he can't just like crawl up them. Um, so he had to stick to the forest to stay hidden by digging into snow. He'd like bury himself in snow. And he said there's actually snow is actually an insulator, so it kept heat in. And then uh, he moved at night under the cover of darkness. And this is he was crawling the whole time, right? Yeah. Yeah, no no movement of your legs. And, like, this whole time, your legs are infected. They're frost, like, they're frostbitten, bited. Yeah, frostbitten. Like, his feet are, like, black, and his legs are blue. Um, so, after crawling through the forest for 18 days, Alexei was found by two Russian villagers uh, who eagerly took him to the closest Russian position. And he was taken to the hospital where both his legs were amputated, after suffering frostbite, and uh, he was reasonably upset uh, about the loss of his legs, but he knew that there were still Germans to be taken care of. So he was given prosthetic legs, and he had to learn how to walk and like fly again. And it said that he got so good that he was like he was like dancing with really? these like prosthetic legs. Yeah, but uh, I didn't even know that was like a thing back then. Me neither. Um, so he's finally let back into his old unit on or in June of the next year, and by the end of the war, he had shot down, one source I found said seven planes, another one said 11, um, but we'll go with 11, because it sounds cooler, uh, by the end of the war, he had shot down about 11 German planes, and had earned the gold star, which was like the highest medal that you, like a Soviet soldier could get, like the medal of honor, yeah, yeah, and he finally left the Russian army a year after the war was over, and he went on to go get his PhD, and I can't remember if it said he wrote an, an autobiography, but at some point a story was written about him, mm. and like he was like hailed so much by the Russians that his book, like his story, was it was like um having to read like East of Eden or what's a book you had to read uh How to Kill a Mockingbird yeah like it was like that important they had to read it in school because I thought that was pretty cool yeah. Um, it's a and crazy story. Yeah, being that guy like crawling. Th you said eighteen days crawling. Yeah, 
with those no food. Frostbitten, destroyed legs. Yeah. I don't know how painful the shattered bones had to have been. Yeah. <laughs> nah, I don't want to. But you got well. You think his legs might be a little numb too, though. Right. I mean, if they were frostbitten, probably. Yeah, so it's not like he'd be in the constant agony. Although I'm still I mean, be, I'm sure be pretty painful. Frostbite too. Yeah. But my point is, it's so cold. Maybe you'd lose a little bit of the feelings. Or maybe he was just like, I don't feel pain. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like it. Yeah. So uh, he died. He he lived a long time. He died in 2001. Uh, he died on May 18th after suffering a heart attack, and he lived for 16 hours before he died. Uh, it said he died like an hour before his 85th birthday. Damn. Yeah. That's, he's that, he lived longer than I would have thought. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. I honestly, when I wrote this, it was really cool, but that was like maybe two minutes. It felt like. I don't know how long it was. I really wish this uh, garage band would tell us. Yeah. Instead of bars, there has to be a way to change that. Never even looked at it. The the video I watched is like ten fucking minutes. And I just did it in two. Ooh. So what do you want to do? Um, what about the new segment? What are we gonna call this segment? Let's brainstorm real fast. Um. Real quick, like. Um. Let's call it porn. Yeah, porn. Welcome to porn. Yeah. So, uh, we are we found some comments on some out there videos. Um, so the first one was POV. Amateur Asian teen reads you the Communist Manifesto. <laughs> <laughs> and the first comment that we well, not the first one on there, but the this one didn't have nearly as funny comments as the next one. Um, but it says. Why is there a hand job tag in the video, bruh? It was just her reading. Yeah, it was just her reading the Communist Manifesto. Nothing sexual about it. Some people were getting off to it, though, like in the comments. Yeah. Uh, apparently, she also reads the Bible. Hmm. So Two vastly different things. Yeah. So she's a, she's a very well-read. Yeah. Plus, on Pornhub, you know. <laughs> um, Altered. Yeah. Uh, this is my favorite one by far. Um... This one, it's called The Lego Movie Porn Parody, L-A-Y-G-O, not L-E-G-O. And uh, it said, anybody have a good chili recipe? <laughs> <laughs> they said that, and then under that, underneath that, there was like another link that somebody responded with. And they're like, this one's great, and it's from The Office. So I think it was like Kevin's, <laughs> oh, Kevin's. Kevin's chili yeah. recipe. There's another comment I found out of that. It was like, anybody want to play Minecraft? <laughs> like, does anybody know how to like safely download Minecraft? Settings? Yeah, that was it. There's a bunch of ones. What was some of the ones, that the videos that we didn't, I don't think you got comments on your videos. Um, I found the hard life of Shrek. Yeah. And it wasn't porn. It was just like the Snapchat filter. Yeah. And play, like playing with somebody. Um, what was the, sni oh, the sniper monkey? Sniper. Oh yeah. So the simp. It's like, I'm not a simp. Oh, yeah, I'm a simp. Sniper monkey. <laughs> <laughs> There's one more that you had. I can't remember. I just didn't expect to find just straight up memes. Yeah, yeah, me. Oh, it was like fucking Mickey and Goofy. Oh, yeah, I was Mickey Mickey and Goofy in Vietnam War. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, uh, it was kind of, what's it called? I can't remember the, the Vietnam movie. Hard or Full Metal Jacket? No. No, it was um, Platoon. Yeah, it was kind of like a, a play on Platoon, but it was like the two soldiers fighting about, like, we need to end this war, and the other one's like, war is all I know. And then it was, I don't know. I don't want to, like, reread it word for word. Yeah. It's a meme. Look it up. Look it up. Yeah, do it. Do it. Full Metal Jack It. Yeah. That's a porn we could direct. Oh, yeah. Full Metal Jack It. Full metal jacked off. Fuck, dude. I just trapped my headphone cord in this notebook and I can't get it out. It's locked in. Oh, son of a bitch. Ow. Well, looks like it's in the notebook now. <laughs> so what else, Joffrey? See, I don't know. You want to go film a video? I didn't prepare enough for this podcast. Me neither. 69 we have to. Yeah, 69 is going to be a fucking banger. Joke intended. Maybe. Maybe it's a joke. Who knows? 
It might be a bang. Who knows? I don't know. Yeah, let's bang. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Don't put it like that. <laughs> Terry better record with us. That's all I'm going to say. Terry. We were going to record last night. We were? I mean, wasn't that the plan last weekend? Wow. Uh, because he I don't said know. he wanted to. Then Vanguard came out and there yeah. was musical instruments. Mm hmm. Vanguard looks pretty sweet. It was based on what I watched him play. It looked very cool. It didn't look as um, realistic. Yeah, as Modern Warfare, but I think that's because it's in between generations of Xbox. Yeah, that's like uh, there was this game called Sunset Overdrive. I used to play, and I got it because like the gameplay looked awesome. But then when I got it for three sixty or. Yeah, for 360, it looked like shit. And I was like, why does this look so horrible? Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, because they put the money into yeah. making it look good on Xbox One. I think that might be what's happening. <laughs> Maybe you just have to get an Xbox a Series uh, X. Series X. I haven't heard anything about them. Because you can't get them. I know, it's just weird because like, it came out and then like it was... Well, it's because of those fucking chips that like, you can't get for your car either. Those are the same chips that... like. You need a PS5 and an Xbox. Maybe we should start making them here. Yeah. That fix a lot of our problems. Um, I'm just drawing a dick on my notebook right now. Nice. Scribble nice. dick. So, did we already shoot the shit, dude? This is like a very short episode. I think so. We apologize? No, no, fuck it. I don't apologize for shit. Take this short episode. Yeah. Take it. Get ready for episode 69. Go on. We're just going to watch porn next week. That's all it's going to be. Yeah. I just drew a cross of dicks. Like a plus sign. <laughs> Is that it? Hmm? Did we shoot it? Yeah, shot. Follow us. Instagram, Grandma's Room Podcast. Twitter, Room underscore Grandma. We made a Locals account. Yeah. That helps us make money on Rumble. Rumble, Terry. Maybe. Uh, we're in Rumble, Grandma's Room. We'd rather you watch there, but we're also on YouTube. We will take any form of support. Um, we... What else? Spotify. We're on Spotify. Um, I guess you could visit our Buzzsprout page. That's just our podcast host, but... If you're... Yeah, it's really not worth it. If you feel so inclined. It's just the company that hosts us and puts us on the other p platforms, so it's not really... It doesn't really mean anything if you go there. So, you know, drop us a review. Yeah, that helps. Say our legs are slick and our tummies are white. Our legs were shaved. Uh, we have uh, playlists on Spotify. Mm -hmm. Grandma's saloon, gram saloon, Grandma's Opium Den, Grandma's Guitar Case, Grandma's Jukebox, Grandma's Crimbus Tree, which is coming up. Mm -hmm. It's about coming the time up. of year. Uh, Grandma's uh, Trap House. Grandma's Clam Jams. Yep. They're all different types of music. Go explore. Yeah, immerse yourself. Hear yourself something nice. Mm hmm. Uh, I think that's it. Yeah. Thanks for listening to this short boy. Yeah, thanks for listening, gang. Could have been anywhere else. Oh. But you spent your time listening to our Slim Jims. Slim Jims absolutely need to be bought next week. For Slim Jims? Yes. Slim Jims and donuts. Get yeah. it? He he he. Yeah. Okay, hot dogs it. and donuts. I say hot dogs and donuts. Let's end this thing. It's okay. Like fucking garbage fire. Thanks for listening. Children.